Good morning, church. On this cold Father's Day. Ah, it's called Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Um, Brother Evans just reminded me that uh, to all of you who received visitors' cards, uh, that if you could, after the service, on my right, go to the visitors' table, uh, you will be assisted there, those that have visitors' cards. It's super cold. Okay. Um, Can we start by praying? Father, we, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you thanks for you are the giver of life. And by your grace, by your will, and your power, you have kept us and you have saved us and drawn us to yourself that we may know you, the only true God. You have given us a new identity in Christ our Lord and you want us to walk in this newness of life. We pray that our, as we look into your word today regarding this truth that you may help us as a church, that you may be the one who convicts and teaches us and helps us to see and understand the beauties and the glories of what you have called us to in Christ our Lord and that we may submit ourselves into walking faithfully with you in this truth, for this is what you have called us for, to walk humbly and faithfully with you. I pray that you also give me the clarity of speech and help me to be able to explain your word in the clearest form, that it may be easy to understand to those who hear In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we've been going through the book of Ephesians as a church and we'll be continuing with the book of Ephesians. So it's it's good to remember this, that we are doing a series of teachings on this book and everyone um, has to follow that. And it also helps from time to time, if you can, those who miss some of these sessions to maybe go on our YouTube channel and follow some of these teachings so that you can be able to uh, close the gaps or the loops from what you may think is missing and has already been covered. And there'll be more that will come through. So today we coming to Ephesians chapter 4. We will be looking from verse 25 to verse 32. The sermon uh, today is titled Putting On and Putting Off. So we have our new identity in Christ and we want to see some examples uh, that show our new identity in action. But I wanted us to think about the few chapters that we've looked at Firstly, we've seen that God has granted us a new identity. In Ephesians 2, if you can remember verse 1 to 7, um, that section is long, but we picked up there that we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive together with Christ. And we also saw in Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, that God chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. We also saw that he blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We also understood from that chapter that he predestined us and adopted us as sons through Christ our Lord. We also saw in verse 14, 13 to 14 of chapter 1, that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So in a nutshell, we see the work that God has done to create a new man and to empower this new man. So as we go to look into these walks, we need to have this background. So as we come to chapter 4, Paul now changes the tone and speaks about 
we should walk in a manner that is worthy of this calling. So we understand we have a new identity, but there's a way we should walk. Our brother Yandre preached on this beautifully last week. So, in verse 17, Paul there testifies that, of, of chapter 4, testifies that the, in the Lord that we should no longer walk like Gentiles in the futility of their minds. In verse 20, he reminds us of the main reason why we as believers walk or should walk contrary to the world. That is the verse that says, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard of, about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires. In verse 24, Paul commands that we put off, we put on the new self that is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we can see that our new identity in Christ is, is, is a wonderful identity because it's created in the likeness of God as opposed to our old corrupt self. So in the section we'll look at, Paul moves on to give us some practical ways or exaltations, encouragements that we should walk in this new way as the new creation. So today, we'll look at these examples that he lists here. If you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. But for context's sake, we can start reading from verse 20. Okay. Okay. But that this is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. So some tend to see what Paul lists here as a list of do's and don'ts. And they see that as a list of do's and don'ts when they take it out of its context. As we see on the context, He's encouraging us to replace or exchange the old sinful actions with, with what identifies with our new nature in Christ. So we look into, into it verse by verse. In verse 25, he starts off by saying, we must put away falsehood. But that's not enough. He's not just saying, as a Christian, stop lying. 
but he's saying replace it with truth. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Firstly, what is falsehood? Falsehood, it's, we know it's lying, deceit. When we misrepresent facts in order to deceive or conceal the truth or the actual reality. Now we've learned that in chapter 2 we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the cause of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. So falsehood was part of our old nature. That's who we were. But Paul says here, let each one speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another as the church. I, I, I learned of a, a disease called autoimmune disease. Um, it happens when the body's natural defense system can't tell the difference between uh, like you, you can't tell between your own cells and the foreign cells that are trying to attack your immune system. Therefore, it causes the body to mistakenly attack the, the normal cells that are supposed to be defending the body. And when that happens, it leads to a number of sicknesses. The doctors here would know, <laughs> like uh, your type 1 diabetes or lupus and many others. So it's a self-inflicting injury. This is what happens when we lie or deceive each other. Lies devour us as the body and injure us. Okay. Some have been hurt by lies or even false rumors that were spread about them, sadly, even in the church. Others struggle, even to this day, to trust believers because they've been hurt by the lies spread about them. This is how hurtful lies can get. But like I said, we hate one another and we are members of one another. We know that lies affect relationships. Some friendships have ended due to the lies. Even relationships between couples have been impacted or severely damaged because of lack of truth. So we, know, we see lies devastate families between husbands and wives. Even at a larger scale, we see how lies even destroy communities. So this is no small matter. And Paul is saying, in our new identity in Christ, this should not be part of our life anymore. This is part of the old self. We have been created for a new life in Christ. Remember what the Lord said in John 8, 44. Speaking to the Jews, he said to them, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of, of lies. So we see the source. We were under him, as we saw earlier in Ephesians. We were following the prince of the power of the air. And lying was what we subscribed to. That's what we wanted. That's what we enjoyed. That's what we thought life is about. But here Paul says we are to substitute this corrupt be behavior with truthfulness because, again, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Speaking the truth is in step with our Lord. He spoke the truth. He is the truth. We trust him because he is full of truth. Truth builds relationships and it produces reliability. No one sees a person who lies consistently and assumes they are a reliable person to be trusted. We must be people of integrity now that we are in Christ. So our yes must mean yes, and our no must mean no. 
We must be known for telling the truth. Even to our own hurt, if need be. Even if we're going to suffer for telling this truth. We must see truth as beautiful and building the church and building one another and see lies as that which hurts the body. So Paul says, in our new nature, we put away this falsehood. It should not be part of us. He then goes on to encourage us on how to continue to walk in this new identity in Christ. Let's look at verse 26 and 27. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. 26, they are taken from Psalm 4 verse 4 which says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds and be silent. So he says, be angry. Anger is an emotion normally demonstrating dislike towards someone you may feel has done you wrong or towards uh, a situation that you didn't like. So it makes you angry. So scripture does not forbid anger, but shows when and how anger can be ungodly. There's many examples we can look at as where we see our Lord being angry. Mark 3 verse 1 is one of them. Where he demonstrated godly anger and righteous anger. When he went to the synagogue and the people were busy selling and making it a, a, a place of business instead of a place of prayer. Or how about when there was a man with a withered hand and it was a Sabbath and the Pharisees were concerned about keeping their traditions and they didn't want him to heal the man who was suffering because it was against their traditions. He was angered at the hardness of their hearts. That's John 2, 13, if you want to read the story. So there is godly righteous anger. But we also see that, we, we see this, that the Lord demonstrated anger at times. And hence Paul says here, be angry, but as he says, be angry, he says, and sin not. And we go, okay, okay, this is a different type of anger he's talking about. Be angry and sin not. Normally we associate being angry with the actions that follow off sinning. So here, what's clear is, he's talking about selfless anger, not selfish anger. Selfless, selfless anger does not lead us to sin. Selfish anger does. Paul says, be angry, yet don't sin. So it's not driven by my sin. It's not driven by my selfishness. An example, when, when it's selfish anger when you get angry at the fact that the innocent are oppressed or are being killed, as we see in the world, the killing of babies all over the world, and it's called not babies. It makes us as Christians to be angry. It's selfless, selfless anger when you see a man beat up his wife and you want to act and protect her. When you see God's name or his word being misused to achieve evil results, you concern that is my father who's being dragged in this and he has nothing to do with it. Selfish anger on another side, it's more about me, it's more self-centered. I feel hurt. So he says, do not let the sun go down in our anger. In other words, we must settle the anger issue in our hearts quickly. And then in 27 he says, and give no opportunity to the devil. So we see that unsettled anger issues lead to the devil finding an opportunity and he utilizes that. So we often feel justified to be angry for however long it may take. 
I will not forgive, forget, I'm still angry, I'm still angry, however long it will take. Some are even known for being short-tempered, they're quick to get angry, and even speak of their anger is a good thing. Others tell people, everyone knows I've got a short fuse, don't mess with me. Okay? When you feel angry for a long time at someone, guess what's happening? We are busy feeding our anger. We anger at someone for hours, for days, until it becomes bitterness. We, we play the situation in our heads over and over, or the actions of the person that made us angry. And the more we do that, the more angry we get, because we're feeding this. So we must be aware, because James also warns us to be slow to anger, because he says our anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So Paul encourages us that as we, when we get angry, we must not let the anger simmer or bubble underneath. But we must quickly seek to settle the issue. We must also pray about the situation and ask the Lord to help us to forgive others quickly, whoever wronged us. We must not, like I said, feed it, feed the anger, because anger is an emotion. It stays consistent the more we feed it. This is not who we are as a new creation in Christ. The people who let their anger simmer and feed it, but we are to seek to settle and make peace and we move on in our relationships with our brothers and sisters. We move on to verse 28. In verse 28 he says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So that he may have something to share. Paul shows us here qualities that are way higher, virtues that are more excellent than stealing which is honest work and sharing. But what is to steal? To take someone's position without their permission or that which does not belong to you? To help yourself on someone's goods? This is to steal. We know we live in a society that justifies stealing and looting and in our old corrupt nature that's what we did. Taking what, what was not ours was something we justified not in Christ. We would say things like I'm poor therefore I must steal it because I need it. How about what we do when we work, I would say, we're stealing company time to do my own things. Nothing will happen. Or how about I don't have a printer at home, so I must use the company resources for my personal things. I'm helping my child with his schoolwork, after all. Or I intentionally submit incorrect tax returns because I don't want the tax man to take more from me. So I cheat the system. I'm stealing from the state. Some even submit incorrect insurance claims because they want huge payouts. I heard recently of someone who did that thing to, to discovery and they found out that actually he owes them way more. Now he must pay about 1.7 million. Or we'd say, whatever we use it for, I don't have data, I don't have this to justify why I must have permission to use this. I know that I'm being paid to work, but I'm using the time for other things. Stealing this time. It's even worse when you see it, our politicians, and um, yeah, it's, 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 
It's one of the most famous words used that we're a corrupt country. You know, stealing is all around us. So you've got cr younger criminals saying, why should we stop because the politicians are doing it? So we must as well just do it. But Paul en encourages us that this is not what should be of us as believers. This is part of our old corrupt nature. We are to rep replace it with a higher virtue of honest and hard work. Not only that, so that we can have something to share with those in need. So God says, if being a thief is what you were, now that you're in Christ, being a giver, this is what you should be. Replace that with sharing and giving. God has raised us up into this newness of life in Christ. So now we walk in love. We care for people. We care for our brothers and sisters. And because of that, we care for those in need. This is our new life. And Paul is encouraging us to walk in this newness of life. We don't just work for ourselves like in the world before to consume on all my needs, my wants. But we also work so that we can have something to share with those who I need. We move on to verse 29. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So this new self-identity in Christ is that we speak words that build up, opposed to the, world, the words that we spoke in the world before we knew Christ, which were destructive and corrupting words. Corrupt talk refers to evil speech, unwholesome talk, unkind words, malicious talk, gossip talk. Paul encourages us to be aware that our words can hurt our brothers and sisters around us. You possibly have experienced stinging words. You possibly have, ex have, have, have said words that you regret. Especially when you've seen how devastating they were, to, they were to others and you could not take them back. Or you've heard someone who has been hurt and devastated by corrupt and hurtful words and they've carried the effects and the scars of those words for years. This is part of our old nature. Corrupting words. Words that encourage people to do corrupt things. Words that devastate people, that devastate those around us. James 3, from verse 9, he says, referring to the tongue, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we, care, with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So we must be people who speak gracious words in love to one another. We can't speak the word of God with our mouths, bless God with our mouths, and speak ill or corruptly to others. And then he moves on to verse 13. Verse 13. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Right in the middle of these beautiful, wonderful exaltations and virtues, this verse comes in. He mentions that we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. We understand we were sealed by the Holy Spirit from chapter 1 for our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. 
So he reminds us that, of this truth rather, that as believers, you don't just have a new self-identity from, from which all these wonderful godly features must flow, but also you have God in you, near you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Not only that he is in you as a believer, but that you must not grieve him. Or oh, he gets grieved when we sin. So, it appears like Paul is adding the Holy Spirit to extend to whatever else type of sins you can think of. Consider this. The Holy Spirit is in you. The list that he has given us is not all things that we should be putting away and putting on. But the key and the core, remember, the Holy Spirit is in you. He gets grieved when he lives in sinful ways as we are in the old nature, whilst we are in the new creation or new nature. When we continue with the old attitudes, because he's working in us a new nature in the likeness of Christ, in the likeness of God. So when we walk contrary to this nature that is working in us, he gets grieved in us. He gets grieved because all that which is of the old nature is of that old, dead, corrupt, sinful, ungodly, ungodly old nature that was unrighteous. So all these ungodly and ugly qualities that Paul has mentioned in this section and more as well as we see are what grieves him in believers. Do we see our sin in this way? How often do we remember that the Holy Spirit is the one working in us and he indwells us as believers? We need to be sensitive to the fact that God is at work in our lives. He's at work in us. In pursuing to walk in the newness of life as we hear in this passage, we should not be, it should not be about pleasing people around us, but it should be about pleasing God himself who indwells us. He is the one who gives us both the ability to desire and to do his will. So our lives are not separated from the Lord. It's not like he saved us and he's aloof. We are here, but he is in us as believers. We are his church. He is the head. He is working in us as a body. Now we look at verse 31 to 32. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Bitterness, which is resentfulness, that wrath and fury, that rage. People know I've got a short temper. That clamor always ready to fight or commotion. Slandering. To angrily speak badly about someone in order to damage their reputation. <coughs> or malice, that hatred intention to hurt someone. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get them for this. Paul says, all of these they must be put away. They are not part of our new identity in Christ. We should not be controlled by these things anymore. We should not persist in them. That's grieve the spirit of God in us. But we should quickly repent and turn away from them, he says. But he says instead, brothers, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. 
So Paul continues to give us some examples of how to treat each other in the newness of life that God is creating in us. In this self-life, self-new life that God is working in us by replacing these hostile behaviors in verse 31. Now in this new man that God is creating and working in us by his spirit, this is how we should act towards one another. Being kind to one another, meaning we should be considerate of one another, thoughtful of each other. This is what God the Holy Spirit is desiring and working towards in all of us. When we become inconsiderate of each other and be unkind of one another, we are working against this flow and this direction that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Some practical ways of being kind to one another is to pray for one another. Help carry each other's burdens. Encourage each other in the Lord. He says we must be tender-hearted to, towards each other, meaning be gentle towards each other. We must not be harsh with one another. That is part of the old nature. It's not part of our new identity in Christ. Our Lord is gentle and lowly in heart. And he is working out this nature in us by his spirit. We must be sensitive to his work. He says we must forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. It's like Paul says, he's saying, believer, do you need a reminder why you should be consistently forgiving one another? Then let me remind you, God in Christ forgave you. That's a big enough reason to forgive each other. When you consider your numerous dark sea of sins and how you broke God's law and you were by nature children of wrath, as Paul showed in chapter 2 of this book, we had a debt we could not pay and no one could rescue us in that state. We were justly faced with eternal punishment and separation from God. Justly so. And until we did something, no. But until God in Christ had mercy on us and rescued us. This is to say, brothers and sisters, we must forgive. We must do so not because others deserve it, just as we didn't. Remember the Holy Spirit in you is working out this new nature created in Christ likeness. If you are in Christ, you have been forgiven, completely so. Not partially, not almost, but you've been forgiven. Therefore realize that others will fall short and sin against you as you will do the same against them. And you will need their forgiveness as well, as they will need your forgiveness at times. So do you have anyone that you have not forgiven in the church? Don't feed the anger or the bitterness. Forgive them and make peace with them. So what we see here is that we have been given a new nature in Christ. We are no longer part of the old corrupt self. God the Holy Spirit indwells us as believers, thus empowering us to live as the new man created after his likeness by putting off all that is corrupt and of, all, of, of the old nature and putting on that which is part of our new identity created after godliness. So we don't follow here or as some look at it as if it's do's and don'ts. But we are being emp we're empowered to live to live out our new nature in Christ. And we would do well to remember, as Paul said in verse 30, 
or reminded us the Holy Spirit is the one. God himself is the one indwelling us and working in us this new identity and we do well to keep in step with him, to not grieve him as we walk in this newness of life. And when we fall short, which we will, we turn to the Lord for his gracious and merciful and ask for forgiveness. But we persist to follow him in what he is doing and working in our lives. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, our God, that you did not just save us, Lord, and, and left us to ourselves on our own and said, I have saved you, there you are. Work out your own salvation on your own, by your own strength. Live out in the newness of life on your own, by your own power. No, you didn't do so. But you dwell in us by your spirit. You have empowered us. You have been given us an enabling power to be able to live out this new life you have called us to. We thank you that you consistently, patiently working it out in us. And we pray, help us where we still struggle to repent and tend to you and to follow you as you lead us. Help us as a body to see the beauty of the work that you are doing in us and to follow you and to embrace this new identity that you have given us in Christ our Lord. We give you all the praise for you are working our God even when we do not see. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.